Private owners flying jet aircraft is nothing new. Owner-operated jets fly thousands of uneventful miles every day. But when a well-meaning owner and pilot of a business jet invites his friend and two passengers for a flight, a routine trip takes a terrible turn. This is the story of a perfectly good airplane, a dual-engine failure, and why the cockpit is no place for a casual attitude. In the early afternoon of March 17, 2013, a Hawker Beechcraft Premier 1A business jet, November 26 Delta Kilo, departs Tulsa, Oklahoma on an IFR flight to South Bend, Indiana. Mild weather en route and clear skies with good visibility at the destination promises a smooth St. Patrick's Day flight. Four people are on board the flight to South Bend. The pilot in command for this Part 91 flight is 58-year-old Tulsa businessman Alex Carson. Premier 26 Delta Kilo is registered under Alex's business. His friend Mark Ellis occupies the front right seat. Alex met Mark at university in the early 1970s, and they recently reconnected through their shared passion for aviation. Alex is eager to share his enthusiasm for his jet with his friend. Mark is also an instrument and multi-engine rated private pilot, but has no turbine airplane experience. Two other passengers are riding along in the Premier's cabin. The climb is uneventful up to a cruising altitude of flight level 410. At 3.52 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Chicago Center requests 26 Delta Kilo to descend and maintain flight level 240, followed by a clearance to 11,000 feet. Center hands 26 Delta Kilo off to South Bend Approach at 4.10 p.m. South Bend Approach instructs 26 Delta Kilo to fly direct to the outer marker for runway 9 or right for a visual approach. South Bend Approach, Premier Jet, 26 Delta Kilo, 11,000. Premier Jet, 26 Delta Kilo, South Bend Approach. Uh, proceed direct to Newt, the outer marker for runway 9 or right, and they'll have uh, lower clearing traffic uh, for the visual approach, 9 or right. Direct to Newt for 09 right, 6 Delta Kilo. At 4.13 p.m., approach clears 26 Delta Kilo down to 3,000 feet. Number 6 Delta Kilo, descend and maintain 3,000. 3,000 now, 6 Delta Kilo. The Premier is only a few minutes away from landing. Two minutes later, November 26 Delta Kilo calls up approach and delivers alarming news. They've lost power in both engines. Uh, we have a engine's dead stick, no power. There's six Delta Kilo, Roger. Uh, did you need assistance? Stop in south uh, side of please. Six Delta Kilo, stay in tension. Uh, we've lost all power and we have no Hydraulics. Six Delta Kilo, Roger. We'll have equipment standing by. Uh, is your craft uh, controllable? Uh, barely controllable. The approach controller calls South Bend Tower to inform them of the dire situation. The tower calls for emergency vehicles to be at the ready. Two Six Delta Kilo lost all the power. He's barely able to control his airplane. You need to roll the trucks now. Alex asks approach control for help. Uh, we have no navigation. If you could give us a vector, please. ATC informs Alex that they're heading in the right direction. Six Delta Kilo, Roger, maintain your present heading south that you're uh, directed right at South Bend Airport, 12 o'clock and 9 miles. At 4.16 p.m., the approach controller tells Alex to turn 10 degrees left, to which he replies, Two Six Delta Kilo, turn left. Two Six Delta Kilo stops responding to ATC, but the aircraft is still airborne. Unsure whether Two Six Delta Kilo can receive audio, approach clears the airplane to land. Six Delta Kilo, if you can hear me, you are cleared for the visual approach, runway 9 or right, or any runway at South Bend. All runways are available at South Bend. Six Delta Kilo, if you're still with me, you can remain this frequency. Again, you are uh, about a three-mile final, runway 9 or right. As the Premier approaches the airport, the tower controller notices that 26 Delta Kilo's main landing gear is not extended. Even though 26 Delta Kilo reported losing all engine power, the tower controller calls for a go-around. 26 Delta Kilo, South Bend. Uh, 26 Delta Kilo, no gear, no gear. Go around if you hear, South Bend, no gear. Tower informs the approach controller of the gear up situation, who also tells 26 Delta Kilo to go around. Right. 6 Delta Kilo, go around. You have no gear. 6 Delta Kilo, if you can hear me, go around. Sometime between 4.16 and 4.19 p.m., November 26 Delta Kilo regained power from at least one of the engines allowing it to abort the landing and perform a climbing right turn. 
the approach controller asks 26 Delta Kilo to ident, and shortly after, the flash appears on their radar screen. It appears November 26 Delta Kilo can receive audio, but is unable to transmit. 26 Delta Kilo, thanks for the ident. Uh, if you'd like to remain in the pattern, that's fine. I cannot hear any of your transmissions. Anything you want to do right now is fine. I do not see your altitude, um, just as a heads up. But uh, vehicles are standing by at South Bend. November 26 Delta Kilo makes right traffic for runway 9 or right. During the second landing attempt, the tower notices the main landing gear is still retracted. Only the nose gear is extended. They relay this information to approach control. Number 26 Delta Kilo Tower says it appears your nose gear only is down. It appears just your nose gear is down. It's unknown whether or not Alex hears this transmission, but he proceeds with the landing attempt anyway. As 26 Delta Kilo impacts the runway with only the nose gear extended, it begins to bounce. A witness reports that the airplane skipped like a rock across water about four or five times before taking off again. The airplane makes a climbing right turn before entering a nose-low, rolling descent. At 4.23 p.m., November 26 Delta Kilo impacts residential housing near the airport boundary. South. South. Crash. Roger, too. Alex and Mark are killed on impact. Incredibly, the passengers in the cabin survived with serious injuries. A person on the ground is also seriously injured. How can a sophisticated business jet like the Premier lose both engines simultaneously? Although Alex was able to restart at least one of the engines, it appears he was unable to regain electrical power or fully extend the landing gear. Investigators soon discovered a key piece of evidence that would explain how the tragic events on board November 26 Delta Kilo unfolded. And what they learned was shocking. November 26 Delta Kilo was equipped with a cockpit voice recorder, or CVR. CVRs are not required on board Part 91 aircraft, but many airplanes that frequently operate under Part 135, like corporate jets, have these devices factory installed. The CVR recorded conversations between the pilot and front seat passenger, interactions with air traffic control, and ambient sounds picked up within the cockpit environment. It records the last 30 minutes of audio in a continuous loop. The CVR recording allowed investigators to create a clear picture of the events leading up to the crash of November 26 Delta Kilo. The recording begins at 3.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time while the aircraft is en route. Alex explains some of the Premier's flight planning considerations to Mark. Most of the conversation simply shows Alex's excitement in talking about his jet. But on closer inspection, some of his comments are concerning. For example, Alex tells Mark that the Premier's landing gear is engineered for a maximum landing weight of 13,000 pounds, but that he doesn't have a problem landing over that limit. As for the published maximum weight, he says, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Alex's willingness to operate the airplane outside published limits indicates several hazardous attitudes. However, his actions during the descent were even more alarming to investigators. At 3.52 p.m., Chicago Center instructs November 26 Delta Kilo to descend and maintain flight level 240. Instead of ending the casual cockpit chat and preparing for the approach, Alex instructs Mark to use the autopilot and thrust levers for descent. Although Mark is a licensed private pilot, he hasn't logged a flight in over four years. He's also not type rated in the Premier and has no jet experience. Moreover, Alex is not a flight instructor, and this is not a training flight. Flight instructors know that an airplane's cockpit makes a terrible classroom. Unsurprisingly, Mark struggles to control the Premier's engines. As the airspeed rapidly increases, Alex does not take control. Instead, he allows Mark to exceed the airplane's maximum speed. For 13.5 seconds, the Premier's overspeed warning is clearly picked up by the CVR. The Premier's Emergency Operations section of the Airplane Flight Manual outlines the procedure to follow in case of an overspeed. 1. Thrust idle. 2. Extend the speed brakes. 3. If the aircraft is in a nose-low attitude, disconnect the autopilot and carefully pitch up to level flight. Instead, Alex remains completely hands-off. As the overspeed warning blares, Mark asks Alex for further instructions on the thrust levers. Just pull it way back? Well, let's just get it out of the line. And we gotta get it so that it trends 
There you go. The overspeed warning seems to have shaken Mark's nerves. He says, I just hate chasing the darn thing. Alex appears unfazed by the overspeed event. He tries to reassure Mark with a joke about his lack of turbine airplane experience. (laughs) How many hours you got flying this jet? Well, I know, but I'm just saying it's just, you know, it's just uncomfortable. Creates creates an alarm in the back. Throw up, gobble down. His lighthearted teasing does little to dispel Mark's discomfort. Mark seems uneasy manipulating the aircraft's controls. Alex ignores his friend's concerns and continues to involve him in the flight operations. At 4.03 p.m., Chicago Center instructs 26 Delta Kilo to descend and maintain 17,000 feet. As the airplane approaches the target altitude, Alex instructs Mark to increase the power to maximum continuous thrust. Now let's go to the stop. Okay. To the click. MCT. Good. As the premiere accelerates, Alex tells Mark to dial in the local altimeter setting. While distracted by the altimeter, Mark fails to notice the jet's swiftly increasing speed. 40 seconds later, 26 Delta Kilo exceeds the maximum speed once again. For 11.4 seconds, the overspeed warning sounds. Once again, Alex is unbothered by the overspeed emergency. He seems to imply that the altimeter distraction was intentional. So that's what a check pilot will do, is he'll give you three things to do. Right, but he knows you're trending in the wrong direction. Five seconds after the overspeed warning stops, Alex gives the thrust controls back to Mark. Your throttles. At 4.13 p.m., 26 Delta Kilo is cleared from 10,000 feet down to 3,000 feet. Alex tells Mark to reduce thrust and slow the Premier to around 210 knots. Let's power back. Let's bring it back to, uh, let's trend towards, uh, 220, 210. Okay. And we'll have to come way out of it to do that. The CVR picks up the sound of a reduction in engine RPM. As Alex runs through the 10,000 foot checks, he asks Mark to reduce speed to 200 knots. Just pull, pull the power out. Just pull it on down? Yeah, let's get back to 200. As Mark pulls back on the thrust levers, he, either intentionally or inadvertently, pulls up on the finger locks. The locks normally prevent the levers from moving past the idle detent. Instead of reducing the power to idle, Mark moves the thrust levers into the fuel shutoff position. This action causes an immediate loss of engine power, interrupting the airplane's electrical system and disconnecting the autopilot. The airplane is at 6,700 feet and still 18 miles southwest of the South Bend Airport. Alex quickly realizes what has happened. Oh, what? You went back behind the stops and we lost power. His focus is now divided between navigating to the airport and restarting the engines at low altitude. The correct course of action would be to run the air start checklist. It explains the correct procedure to restart an engine in flight. If the airplane is flying at least 200 knots, there is sufficient airflow to spin the engine up for a relight. Below 200 knots, the pilot must engage the starter. November 26 Delta Kilo's exact speed during the engine shutdown is unknown, but it's likely to have been around 200 knots or greater. However, the CVR doesn't record Alex reading a checklist or performing the correct restart actions. About 40 seconds after engine shutdown, the CVR records the engine's starter spooling up. However, a sound spectrum analysis indicates that the engine ignition was not on as required for an air start and that the restart did not succeed. Shortly after 26 Delta Kilo's emergency transmission to South Bend approach, the CVR loses power for eight seconds. During this time frame, 26 Delta Kilo can still receive audio from ATC and transmit. What caused the power interruption to the CVR? The answer requires a closer look at the Premier's electrical system, a key part of the investigation. Two electrical buses power the Premier's main aircraft systems the essential bus, and the standby bus. The essential bus powers the systems critical to aircraft operations, including most flight instruments, communications and navigation radios, landing gear, and engine starters. It also powers the CVR. In case the essential bus fails, the Premier has a standby bus, 
This bus powers the minimum amount of equipment required to safely land the aircraft. Neither the landing gear extension system nor the landing gear status lights will work. Flaps and anti-skid braking will also be unavailable. During normal flight operations, the engine-driven generators power the essential and standby buses. If the generators are inactive, the 24-volt main battery provides power. If the essential bus loses power, the standby bus has its own battery that provides at least 30 minutes of emergency power to limited equipment. A battery switch in the cockpit can be set to on or standby. The on position uses the main battery and the standby position uses the standby battery. If the pilot selects the standby position without the generators running, power to the essential bus will be lost. Investigators concluded that a power interruption to the essential bus caused the 8-second loss of CVR audio. The report suggests the most likely reason is the pilot manually moving the battery switch from on to standby. The investigators also found the slightly bent battery switch in the standby position in the aircraft wreckage. De-energizing the essential bus inhibits the starter and ignition systems, which prevents engine restart. After the CVR comes back online, November 26 Delta Kilo is still without engine power and navigation equipment. A minute later, the CVR cuts off for the final time. Without the CVR to tell the story and no further radio calls from the airplane, investigators had to piece together what happened during November 26 Delta Kilo's final seven minutes. Sometime between the CVR failure and the go-around, Alex managed to restart the left engine. This implies that power was re-established to the essential bus, enabling the ignition system. Why then was the landing gear only partially extended? Well, investigators found the emergency manual gear extension handle partially pulled out. This explains why only the nose gear was extended. The handle needed to be pulled several inches more to deploy the main gear. However, it doesn't explain why Alex didn't extend the gear using either main battery power or the left generator after engine restart. The Premier is designed to fly on one engine. If Alex went around because of a gear extension issue the first time, why did he not climb to altitude, circle, and troubleshoot? Investigators could not find a reason for 26 Delta Kilo's immediate return for another landing attempt. The aircraft's improper configuration made a safe landing essentially impossible. The NTSB's final report identifies two probable causes for this accident. First is the private pilot's inadequate response to the dual engine shutdown during crew's descent. Second, the NTSB includes the pilot's decision to allow the unqualified, pilot-rated passenger to manipulate the airplane controls. The NTSB also emphasized the pilot's failure to adhere to procedures, which ultimately resulted in his failure to maintain airplane control during a single-engine go-around. The NTSB could not find any evidence of mechanical issues that would have caused the crash. All of the evidence points towards a fairly inexperienced jet pilot who made several unfortunate errors in judgment. These errors resulted in a situation that exceeded his aircraft knowledge, hindering his ability to respond promptly and correctly. While a dual engine failure at low altitude is extremely rare, following the correct procedures would likely have resulted in a safe landing. The air start checklist outlines the engine restart procedure, including the steps the pilot must take to re-establish generator power. It is the pilot's responsibility to ensure that they are able to remember and execute emergency memory items and locate appropriate checklists. Of course, the accident sequence began long before the engines were shut down. The pilot's decision to allow an unqualified passenger to operate the aircraft set disaster in motion. Regulations and procedures exist for a reason, to keep us and those who depend on us safe. Airmanship involves more than stick and rudder skills. It requires us to use good judgment and be masters of our aircraft at all times. Aviation is unforgiving of pilots who do not meet these high standards on every single flight. Thanks for watching and fly safely.